Greetings. Thank you for having me, albeit via video. I very much wish I was with you in person. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how our changing concept of what a library is directly affects our ability to plan for shared network services. In particular, how a shifting concept of the library as a community hub and emerging social movement requires a different approach to shared services. We have to explore the, the very real change from a library as a set of resources for a community to access to the library as a supporter of building community knowledge locally. While I could jump right into my recommendations for shared services for the next decade, hint, it's more about people development than collection development, my recommendations might seem pretty arbitrary unless I set up why we need to change in the first place. I promise not to get too abstract here, but we need to start with a pretty basic set of assumptions. First, what do we mean by the word library anyway? Now, one could say, I have a difficult relationship with words. In particular, I tend to get a bit obsessed with definitions. For example, in 2007, the then dean of Drexel's iSchool, David Fenske, and I were talking about libraries. He made a comment to the effect of, the field of librarianship will always be held back until one can define what a librarian is without reference to a building. In essence, what is a librarian without a library? Four years later, the direct result of this comment was a 400 page plus book called The Atlas of New Librarianship. I think we can all agree that that's a bit of an overreaction for anyone, but Here's the thing about words, like library and librarians. Once created, they rarely lead a stable life. Their definitions and usages evolve. Fenske's question about how we define what a librarian is began an intensive investigation about the term library that continues to this day for me. It began me thinking about how do we define and conceptualize libraries and the work of librarians. You and I are on a journey of definition. That shouldn't really surprise you. After all, you keep having this meeting for the simple fact that what we do and why we do it, our definition, changes. It changes for our communities as well, but they often aren't aware of it. Our communities haven't been deeply enmeshed in the debates about libraries as community hubs or members versus patrons. And so the words we use to describe ourselves, our services, and even the terms we use for them can be jarring for them. And it is always dangerous for us if it is jarring for them. To have a bit of fun with this, let me quickly present uh, shifting ways of thinking about libraries as a sort of progression through evolutionary eras. To be clear, this is not a rigorous chronology but rather a, a way of highlighting how we conceptualize libraries, librarianships, and the services we offer, and therefore, the network services that we need. For the purpose of this talk, these eras start out a bit more cartoonish and stereotyped, warning. However, I believe that overall, it's a helpful way of thinking about planning for shared library services. I would add some nifty Latin terms to these eras, but well, I failed Latin, so we'll begin with the era of the book palace. The start of the book palace epoch um, is a bit hard to nail down, but it arguably defined libraries in the Western world for well over three centuries, from about the 1600s onward. But for our purposes, we'll pick the sort of Dewey-esque era turn of the 20th century as the start point. It was a, a time when collecting books was vital because they were scarce. The great value of the library was in pulling collections together, and the vast majority of those books that we gathered were about the rest of the world, not our service communities. It was a time of grand architecture. It was also a time of universalists and documentalists, that is, folks who believed that knowledge could be contained in the pages of a book, and that knowledge of the world could be sorted out into nice, neat, firm categories ignoring that those categories were often developed by and for a culture dominated by white guys. The king of the information world was the book. The libraries were the apex predator in this information ecosystem. One, ways, one way you can see how we and others thought about libraries 
is at looking at the relationship we had with them. Them, as in the folk, what do we call the folks that we served? This was the golden era of the patron. Patrons supported the library. They received service from the library. They were also nearly anonymous. We didn't spend a heck of a lot of time defining patrons because we were mostly the only players in town and our value to these patrons was implicit. Just as we look at the tools developed to demark epics of human evolution, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and so on, we'll do the same thing here. What were the defining tools of the Book Palace era, particularly for networks of them? And the answer for me is union catalogs and interlibrary loan. With the dawn of the computer age, we could connect our collections together. The work of consortia and library networks was around standardization and efficiency. We sought to use the same cataloging standards. We had closely aligned management structures. We were linking similar to similar. The role of the network was to create standards and to then share materials. So, what brought about the end of the Book Palace epic? Networks. Not computers, we've been putting up online catalogs since the 70s. No, it was that now we could connect these things via network. Not only records, but digital files as well. And we therefore needed to get into the full text business. We needed to get online, we needed to change. So libraries became information centers. We were no longer just a place with stuff, we were a gateway to the world, and that world was information. Gone was the quaint Victorian era concept of the patron, and in was the modern user, a term freshly taken from computer scientists and drug dealers. Now, it wasn't about having it all, it was about being able to get to it all. And if it wasn't online, then by God it better be. This was the era of mass digitization. Google and libraries hooked up to scan the world. I remember talking with a Harvard librarian at the time who said their main obstacle in digitizing materials was how to get trucks onto Harvard Yard to take away the books and turn them into bits flying free into the ether. The scanner and the contract were the defining tools of the information center age. If we couldn't scan it, we would license it. Databases, ebooks, video services. The drive was to expand the collection with resources from around the world. In our drive to provide users with access, we also transformed the very nature of collecting. Gone were the days of owned materials being ferried around the countryside in delivery vans. Well, not gone, but we didn't put them on the postcards anymore. In were Dublin Core and metadata schemas that we used to build towering virtual libraries. Gone also were the days of budget strained to buy materials one time. Now we had to devote budgets to paying for access to a resource annually. A change that is now, once again, coming back to haunt us with terms of ebook lending and licensing from publishers. We also spent a lot of money on public access computers. Our collaborative network services, digitization support, shared and statewide licensing agreements, metadata schema development, and training to build a killer website. Now, a funny thing happens when you move from patrons to users and from collecting to access. You tend to move from relationships to transactions. Instead of telling the story of the library and outcomes for our community, we began to quantify ourselves. Now, instead of just counting our volumes, we emphasized circulated items, attendance, and of course, the ever lovely gate counts. So what pushes us out of this era of libraries? Well, simply, we lost our monopoly. Now, to be clear, libraries haven't been the sole source of information and access since, well, ever. Though we did have a lock on medieval Europe until Gutenberg went and screwed that up, but we're not going there today. But we at least had a large portion of the mind share in our communities. With the advent of ubiquitous networks like the internet and the ability to monetize access, mostly through advertising, our portion of the mind share shrank. 
we needed a new way of thinking about libraries and librarians and our value to communities. We didn't just invent these new services out of thin air. Rather, we saw non-access and non-collection activities in a new light. We saw that the value we provide to the community was in the community itself. We became the third space. And instead of users, we now had citizens or members. Our focus wasn't on collections alone, but on being a place where community members could come and think and work with or without these collections. Our newly emphasized focus was on civic improvement. We helped folks find jobs. We provided vital literacy services to youth and adults. We were a safe place to explore dangerous ideas. And what tool helped define this era? The Library Cafe. Yes, the cafe as in literally the place to serve coffee, but also in numerous spaces where we pulled down the stacks or never built them in the first place to allow folks to get together. We call them living rooms or agora or simply the teen space. Many cities rebuilt or refurbished central libraries to promote economic development by getting people to the place. We began hosting co-working spaces. Our consortia still paid for licensed resources and we still ship materials around, but now our joint services began to go a little fuzzy. How do we collectively support what is by definition a very local thing? This is also the time when our communities began to get very confused. Sometimes that was phrased inelegantly as in, why do we need libraries when we have Google? It was when our communities began wondering, what's the difference between a library and a community center? It was also the time that we got very good at posts on Instagram. Because we had a hard time putting our contribution into words, we had no problem showing the growing number of diverse faces coming into our buildings. Our identity became more diffuse and more local in nature. But it was the seeking for an identity that led to our next era, though it's more a later part of the third space era, but for now we'll call it the era of the community hub. We began to put words and concepts to this third space. But as often happens, we were better at saying what we weren't as much as we were of what we did. We weren't a community center in an open meeting room. We weren't indoor parks with books. We were a learning center and a community hub. Our members became learners, and our focus rested squarely on the community creating its own knowledge and identity. Our tool of preference? The makerspace. No, not just 3D printers in a room, but the idea that the community could come together and create in a library. For some libraries, the makerspace is 3D printers and hand tools. For others, it's a wide open living room for group chats. Still others, it was the marked spike in programs where community members taught their fellow community members. In libraries across the globe, video and audio studios began popping up. Those scanners we once used to digitize the materials of the library, we turned them loose on family photo albums. Our walls were pulled down for workshops. We looked into the eyes of the smart city crowd and claimed the smart citizen as our turf. We loaned out baking pans with our books and even had cooking classes to boot. We not only paid for Canopy, we created our YouTube channels. We talked about great libraries building communities and the communities as the true collection of any library. The Tilburg Public Library in the Netherlands took over a former train maintenance warehouse and built pop-up libraries right next to incubators for new business startups. They used these pop-ups as places of experimentation and play that ultimately led to the very impressive, and in the audience, local. The IP center at the British Library moved the business reference books to the side and retrained the librarians as business planning experts. The era of the community hub was, well, is, a reaction to the retreating human interface of government as well. 
Our members could no longer talk to a person with questions about taxes or social services. The face of healthcare went from doctors and a nurse to a patient portal. Into this vacuum stood librarians ready to help, and to support them, social workers, and to support them, artists and writers in residence. Instead of giving the books the best views from our new glass and steel libraries, we created the library as a destination. Our value was now in quality of life. I would say many of us are living firmly in this community hub epoch. We are, however, already starting to see the need for continued evolution in this approach. In the UK, for example, too many local councils have seen the community well integrated with the workings of the library and made the unfortunate jump that the community itself could maintain these libraries through volunteer-only staffs. In the Netherlands, there are no more library schools because community-centered librarianship is being defined as user experience and customer service versus librarianship and its values and skills. In Florida, they are having theme park experts design libraries as an experience instead of librarians designing libraries as a service. Now, don't get me wrong. We should be designing our libraries with the experience of people in mind. We should be building organizations that serve. But in doing so, we must recognize the unique value librarians bring to this endeavor. That is also not to say that as a profession, we are necessarily where we need to be to, to do this. Within the library, we have to look at ourselves. Are we best structured to serve as a community hub? If evolution happens to ensure survival of the fittest, are we fit? How much of our preparation for librarianship cover event planning? How much focus do we put in skills uh, development around technology and collection building and how much on community engagement and cultural skills? How open are we to the entire community when all too often we organize ourselves as hierarchical management structures where some positions never have to interact with the public? Which brings me to an emerging area and my attempt to answer what shared services and resources do we need in today's library landscape? It is the conceptualization of the library as a movement. It is taking all of this evolution to the next level. The focus isn't on collections or access or places. It is on mobilizing a community for social action. Instead of calling folks patrons or users or even my personal favorite members, we don't have names for them at all because the walls between them and us begin to break down. Libraries bring together people of diverse and even clashing perspective to seek common ground. The greatest asset that we have in this era is trust. In a world filled with a cacophony of perspectives, propaganda, and belief presented as truth, we serve as vital social infrastructure and trusted facilitators working across community divisions to develop a new community narrative. And I know that last sentence borders on buzzword salad, but all it means is we help members of a community find meaning and find power in each other. And in the era of the library's movement, how this happens is going to be different in every library and every community. In this new era, we not only support reading because literacy is a vital skill in making change in democratic participation, we team with primary schools and the local pizza restaurant to ensure we use common vocabularies and we create a whole culture of reading. In a project for the Hearst Foundation, we created a community literacy initiative. We found that classroom teachers and youth librarians would use the exact same words with totally different definitions. Literacy for the teachers was skill development for decoding and understanding texts. For librarians, it was reading enrichment and the promotion of a love or culture of reading. Parents would take their children from a school to library, hear the same words, and have no idea why they were getting mixed messages and why it wasn't making sense to them. 
a literacy researcher on the team, was demonstrating how story time could be used to both enhance literacy skills and the love of reading to a set of parents. After the session, a mother with her infant child came up to the researcher. What did you say on that page, she'd ask. Then, and, and what about on that page, and, and, that, and that page? It took the researcher a moment to realize that the parent couldn't read. But instilling reading skills in her child was so important, she was going to memorize this book so she could share it with her baby. That story led to not only local restaurants having library-picked books available for kids while they ate, but the city council passed a resolution that every town-sponsored event had to have a literacy component. The governor of the state not only signed a declaration about the importance of reading, he recorded a video to be used in all of the schools throughout the state. My point is that the community, the schools, the libraries, the businesses, the parents, came together to create change, to create a movement. And the library was part of that movement, but it could never have done it on its own. And here's the most important part. What worked in Columbia, South Carolina, will not work in your community. No matter how well we document it, or call it a best practice, or try and turn it into a downloadable toolkit, it won't work for you. It's not meant to. It's meant to be a guide to instruct and inspire you. You, the librarian, your job is to see what will work in your community. That's the difference from the era of the book palace. Rather than trying to connect similar to similar, to make a suite of unified and undifferentiated services for all, the networks of today have to train librarians to adapt, not adopt. The network supports and inspires. Of course, all of these phases of our evolution still coexist together. Take, for example, the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy, or SKILL, which was the South Carolina Center for Children's Books and Literacy, which started as a collection of award-winning children's books. The center has a collection of both award-winning children's books and other books that help teachers learn about including diverse and representative materials into their lessons. It also has digital services. However, in the past few years, the movement aspect of skill, as we call it, has emerged. We have a bus full of books. No big surprise there. But this bus is also filled with university students from across the campus. And this guy. This is Cocky, the university mascot, and something of a celebrity here in South Carolina. That bus, Cocky's Reading Express, goes to the poorest schools in the state. Those college students, they read to the kids and demonstrate how vital reading is. And the books, well, that's where Cocky comes in. You see, he gives them out, over 120,000 books given to kids, where they then have to promise cocky, a symbol of sport as much as anything else, that they'll read every day. And the center doesn't stop there. We work with social safety net organizations to do one-on-one -on -one consulting with those in need to connect them with housing and food and other social services in their most desperate hours. We work with immigrant groups to advocate for bilingual education. Why isn't this a community center? Why isn't this just a bunch of volunteers with bookshelves? Because of the answer to David Fenske's question. It's because librarians with their skills, values, and mission are not simply delivering these services, they are shaping them. Librarians are ensuring privacy in a data-driven world. Librarians are ensuring these services are both inclusive in their design and equitable in their delivery. And here comes, here we come to the meat of the issue. What kind of shared services do we need now in this era? What do libraries need to support local movements? Awareness, continuous learning, mentorship, and a memory. Awareness is looking across libraries, cities, and industries for ideas that can help the communities we serve. What do libraries do in the face of artificial intelligence? How can we best advocate for our communities to put in place safeguards for personal data? How can we better welcome refugees? How can we build platforms for the community to connect people of shared interest? 
as an aside, the union catalog of today is the foundation of a community learning management system of tomorrow. A system that directly links a person with resources, experts, and then tracks personal progress in mastering new skills and insights. Of course, awareness of an idea and the ability to adapt it to local needs is a very different thing. And I do mean adapt, not adopt. Our staff needs to be constantly acquiring new skills. Technical skills, certainly, but facilitation skills, political skills, research skills to implement technologies, programs, and services that look like and include the community itself. As librarians develop their new skills and seek to implement new ideas in a community, they need guidance and fellowship. Networks of libraries need to provide mentoring and coaching. We need to develop future leaders and build strong ties among the most remote colleagues. Lastly, there needs to be a shared memory. This memory ranges from classical archives of community development to identifying and highlighting innovation among the group. If this sounds a bit familiar, well, it is. The future of shared library service is a university of the people, a function that engages librarians and the community players who are part of these local movements in learning, teaching members how to organize collective action, bringing together industries with librarians to forge common goals. And, just as all ideas need to be adapted to local needs, this library university does not have to look like a classical university. Right? Don't build lecture halls, but cooperative laboratories. Teach online, sure, but also learn together in pop-up libraries and malls and beaches and football stadiums. Right? Forget periodic diplomas and instead put in place continuous portfolio building and no classes without partners and community members making this real in their lives. So there you go. My quick trip through the evolution of libraries. A trip that will never be complete because we are a living, thriving profession. Our communities need us now more than ever. They need us because we are trusted places to make sense of a world increasingly racked with xenophobia and a dangerous flavor of nationalism that seeks to define a nation only by people who think and look like us. Our communities need trusted professionals to ensure not only their rights, but to amplify their voices in debates on the future. So there you have it. From an unhealthy relationship with dictionaries to the People's University. I hope this has been useful, or at least entertaining. I look forward to the conversation to come.